Looking out over the roofs of the houses that make up the city of Paris in the early 1920s, a young Ernest Hemingway, deep in the throes of a severe case of writer's block, fixed his gaze on nothing in particular and reminded himself of a simple mantra that he had repeated a thousand times before. You have written before and you will write now. All you have to do is write one true sentence. Write the truest sentence you know. The young Hemingway took heed of his own advice and walked back into his study where he continued to write. In this time, many more months followed, and in these many months, there were many times where he would have to reiterate the same mantra. Through varying drafts, stop and starts, and extensive rewrites, Hemingway would never forget the crux of the matter, the very soul of the problem at hand, writing the truest sentence he possibly could. And in time, with unyielding determination, these sentences soon became paragraphs, which slowly formed to make chapters, the many of which fell together to shape his first novel based on the lost generation residing in Paris during the 1920s, The Sun Also Rises. When The Sun Also Rises hit the shelves on the 22nd of October 1926, the book was immediately met with high praise. Hemingway's unique style of seemingly objective, short to the point sentences and utilization of what would later be coined the iceberg theory seemed a breath of fresh air in the literary world. And the simple story of five expatriates travelling from Paris to Spain to see the running of the bulls in Pamplona seemed to fit this style perfectly. In his lifetime, Hemingway never wrote an on writing or a why I write, yet amongst many works and unearthed letters, he often left golden nuggets of advice to writers aspiring to reach the literary pinnacles of which Hemingway had reached himself. One of the most quoted of these nuggets of advice is the one true sentence excerpt from his memoir, A Movable Feast. Hemingway knew that in the time of creative hardship, when the story would not get going, he could always rely on the simple act of writing a true sentence, as he always had one from things he saw or from conversations he had or overheard, and from there he would begin to unfold the story. The act of accurately and truly retelling the details of an event or scene thus became a staple of Hemingway's writing ability, and the content he often wrote about, whether it be bullfighting, Paris, World War I, deep sea fishing, or the Spanish Civil War, had derived from events he had personally witnessed and experienced. Hemingway's stories have become a byproduct of his life. Yet this ability to write accurately and truly from these events had not fallen into his lap and neither did the events themselves. Instead, in the summer of 1926, when Hemingway sat down to write The Sun Also Rises within a six week period, he had largely pulled from an array of experiences and writing techniques that had stemmed from his career as a journalist. Working for the Kansas City Star in the late 1910s and Toronto Star Weekly in the early 1920s. Working as a cub reporter and later a foreign correspondent, Hemingway's desire for adventure and natural talent for writing went hand in hand with the requirements of his job, and subsequently, he enjoyed a short but successful career, which unfortunately ended due to in-office disputes and a need to pursue what Hemingway truly thought he was supposed to, fiction. But nevertheless, it was journalism that gave Hemingway the key to events and scenes he otherwise might not have been able to access. It was journalism that introduced Hemingway to his long-lasting love of bullfighting, and it was journalism that gifted Hemingway with the tools to write a true sentence. Hemingway's career in journalism began in late October 1917, at the age of 17. After finishing high school and with a reluctance to continue on to college, Hemingway had aspirations of joining the army, yet due to the required age limit being 18, he instead took a job at the Kansas City Star as a cub reporter, a job that was made possible through his uncle, Tyler Hemingway, who had gone to college with the paper's chief editorial writer. Hemingway would only last six months at the Kansas City Star, Yet the skills he would learn would remain in his writer's toolbox throughout his career in journalism and fiction. Upon entering the paper's headquarters on his first day, Hemingway was immediately handed the star copy style sheet, 
a list of rules to stick to in order to parrot the star's writing style. The first few lines open with four simple requirements. Use short sentences. Use short first paragraphs. Use vigorous English. Be positive, not negative. Absorbing these rules, Hemingway ambitiously dove into his work, spending most of his time outside of the office, choosing to get up close and personal with the subjects he covered. A standout piece he wrote during this period was titled At the End of the Ambulance Run, published on January 20th, 1918. At the end of the ambulance run displays the ebb and flow of patients in the Kansas City General Hospital during the night shift. Hemingway details the conveyor belt-like way in which patients, some on the brink of death, are hauled in, worked on, and hauled out, either dead or alive. Additionally, Hemingway tells of these patients' backstories, one of them being an old printer whose left thumb needs to be amputated and is reluctant to do so through fear of not being able to work. The man later returns drunk and crying, telling the doctor to take the whole damn works. Other characters include a man, only identifiable through a receipt with his name on it, who suffered skull fractures during a street brawl. He died within four hours of arriving at the hospital. And also, a young girl who had attempted suicide but was saved. The rest of the article tells these stories case by case, with Hemingway attempting to humanise the multiple patients, while stressing the constant of the surgeon's job to work his magic and fix what is broken all before the patient is wheeled off, and the next one comes rolling in. And so the work goes on. For one man it means a clean bed and prescriptions with whiskey in it. Possibly for another, it is a place in the potter's field. The skill of the surgeon is exercised just the same, no matter what the cause of injury or the deserts of the patient. Hemingway was assigned to write at the end of the ambulance run, only three months into his time at the Kansas City Star, and in his following three months, he would continue producing articles, all without a single byline. Yet byline or no byline, Hemingway had still shown dedication to the job, which left him in the good graces of the paper's editors. Eyewitnesses once described seeing Hemingway sprinting down a street after an ambulance, with notepad and pen in hand. However, despite showing promise in journalism, Hemingway still wanted to be in the army and get involved in World War I, and upon turning 18, he had attempted to do so. Hemingway's attempts at joining the war proved to be a difficult task, as he was unable to pass any physical examinations due to his poor eyesight. But as luck would have it, upon being assigned to interview Italian Red Cross officers who were seeking out American volunteers of good health, Hemingway signed up to the American Red Cross as an ambulance driver in late April of 1918. Within days, he was sent off to Italy to join in on the action, and he wouldn't return to America until January 1919. Hemingway had returned from the war with stories and scars, and he wasn't bashful about relaying them to anyone willing to listen. In late 1919, in a cottage owned by Hemingway's family, in which a women's group was being hosted, Hemingway had caught the attention of one Harriet Conable whilst telling of his war experiences. Hemingway had explained his need for work, and she offered for him to live at her mansion to look after her and her husband's disabled son in Toronto whilst the couple were away on holiday. Hemingway agreed as it would allow him to earn a decent wage and focus on his writing. Upon arriving at the Conable's house, Hemingway had asked that he be introduced at the Toronto Star, to which Harriet obliged, leading to Hemingway befriending Greg Clark, a writer and editor at the Toronto Star Weekly, who then introduced Hemingway to the chief editor, J. Herbert Cranston. Within days, Hemingway was writing articles once again as a freelance journalist, and on the 6th of March 1920, published his first byline, which was titled, A Free Shave. A Free Shave focuses on cheap services but mainly the Mola Barber College, a college located in Toronto which was offering free shaves to the public so their students could gain experience in the trade. Hemingway had offered himself up to the free shave and wrote of his experience, jokingly stressing the bravery required to do so 
and building up the tension of the act of bravery through dialogue and descriptions of the setting. He describes entering the barbershop and the hush that falls over the room as he states his intentions of going upstairs to the beginner's department. Ascending the stairs he arrives at the top and sees nothing but empty chairs lining the walls and a group of students standing together chatting. He proceeds to sit down and a young red-haired student approaches him. The red-haired student slowly begins the preparations, with Hemingway bravely sitting back and expecting the worst. He notices a bandage on one of the boy's hands. Asking what it was for, the red-haired student explained how he was removed from the downstairs department to the top because of an accident. The dialogue continues and the moment arrives. The student lathers the face and the razor gets closer and closer to the neck. The free shave is about to begin. And in a five word review, Hemingway culminates the tension to an indifferent conclusion. The shave wasn't so bad. For the remainder of the article, Hemingway highlights other avenues to which you can cheapen certain services. These include cheap dentistry at the Royal College of Dental Surgeons, a free dispensary at Grace Hospital, and free meals from the Fred Victim Mission Queen and Jarvis Streets. Or, as Hemingway concludes, you could easily grant yourself these services by following one simple step. If you wish to secure free board, free room and free medical attention, there is one infallible way of obtaining it. Walk up to the biggest policeman you can find and hit him in the face. Hemingway would thus continue to write for the Star Weekly and subsequently produce more bylines. He was earning double of that which he did as a cub reporter. Yet over time, Hemingway had longed for a return to Europe, and by October of 1921, he wrote to star managing editor John Bone on his desire for a change. Bone was enthusiastic about Hemingway, and as a result, granted him his wish by securing him a job as a foreign correspondent in Europe, a job in which Hemingway was able to experiment with his style, and that gave him access to a post-war Europe not easily accessible to the everyday man and also with a paycheck to go along with it. Within three months, Hemingway would leave Toronto and arrive in Paris. Paris in the 1920s was a haven for expatriates. It was home to many artists and writers, as the cost of living there was low, and it would later prove to contain future great literary figures like F. Scott Fitzgerald, John Dos Pesos and James Joyce, among more, all of whom Gertrude Stein would later coin a lost generation. Upon entering Paris, marvelling at the low price in which a man and his wife could survive, Hemingway wrote an article detailing the expenses he paid in Paris in relation to those he did in Toronto. The article would be aptly titled, A Canadian with $1,000 a year can live very comfortably and enjoyably in Paris, and was published on February 4th, 1922. Paris. Paris in the winter is rainy, cold, beautiful and cheap. It is also noisy, jostling, crowded and cheap. It is anything you want, and cheap. The piece is short, to the point, and mostly what it says on the tin. Hemingway lists off the prices of his Paris apartment, which he shared with his wife, and notes the exchange rate of the Canadian and US dollar with a French franc, stating that the US dollar at that time was worth 12 and a half francs, whereas the Canadian dollar was 11. Hemingway warns against staying in large hotels, and instead advises the readers to seek out small but cheap hotels, as the former's prices are aimed at tourists and thus increased. It is due to these bumped up prices Hemingway claims that Paris was considered an expensive place to live, when in reality it was the opposite. The article ends with an anecdote of two women from New York who had stayed in one of these large hotels, which cost him 500 francs for two days and three nights. They subsequently moved to a smaller hotel on Hemingway's advice, and were able to last two weeks for the same amount of money. As well as enjoying the cheap life of Paris with his wife, Hemingway had also formed relationships with the writers and artists of the time, with one of the most influential connections he made during this period being Gertrude Stein. Stein would be one of a small number of people who read and critiqued Hemingway's writing during this period and she would often advise him to quit journalism to pursue fiction, and additionally, in 1923, she became the catalyst for his love of bullfighting when she suggested he travel to Madrid to witness the bullfights for himself. 
Hemingway would thus travel to Madrid and immediately become obsessed, later recording his experience of his first bullfight in an article, published on October 20th, 1923, titled, Bullfighting is not a sport, it is a tragedy. The aficionado Hemingway would later prove to be all began with the events described in this article. Much like a free shave, Hemingway begins the article by providing a narrative of his experience on the subject. He includes details like the travel from Paris to Madrid, his excitement as he waited to enter the ball ring, and the reference of friends who were only referred to by their first name, and no further explanation other than they experienced the bullfight too. From here, the ceremonial details prior to the bullfight and the bullfight itself are described step by step. However, once again Hemingway builds the narrative of his experience into an expected conclusion, in this case the death of the bull, and upon arriving at said conclusion, cuts it short, penning the lines, I am not going to describe the rest of that afternoon in detail, before proceeding into the more traditional writing of a journalist. The stigma surrounding the sport of bullfighting was prevalent in the era in which the article was written, and Hemingway acknowledges that stigma, yet counters it by rejecting bullfighting as a sport, preferring to call it a tragedy. I am not going to apologise for bullfighting. It is a survival of the days of the Roman Colosseum, but it does need some explanation. Bullfighting is not a sport. It was never supposed to be. It is a tragedy, a very great tragedy. The tragedy is the death of the bull. It is played in three definite acts. Act 1 of the three definite acts Hemingway refers to is the entrance of the bull, and the picadors receiving attacks whilst attempting to protect their horses. Act 2 is the planting of the banderillas. Act 3 is the death of the bull. Hemingway notes how the role of the matador, or torero, in these three acts must at least be proficient, yet rarely do you see a matador that excels in all three. Some, he claims, like Joselito, a bullfighter who died in the ring, are great banderilleros. Some, like Chicuelo, the matador Hemingway watched in his first bullfight, are great with their capes, and others are great killers, most of which, according to Hemingway in the final lines of the piece, are gypsies. A month prior to the article being published, Hemingway had moved back to Toronto due to his wife being pregnant. During this time, an office dispute between John Bone, the man who gave Hemingway the foreign correspondent position, and city editor Harry Hindmarsh had left Hemingway in the crossfire, with Hindmarsh hating Hemingway due to his being a byproduct of Bone. Hemingway and Hindmarsh had never got on with one another, yet the beginning feud between Hindmarsh and Bone only proved to add to the already rising tension. Nevertheless, Hemingway would continue working as a journalist in Toronto whilst his wife was pregnant, yet this rising resentment and tension would prove to be fatal to Hemingway's career. One story Hemingway had covered during this period was in September of 1923, in which a bank robbery took place. Hemingway had completed the piece, submitted it, and was denied a byline. Following this, Hemingway had been assigned to cover the arrival of UK Prime Minister David Lloyd George in New York, yet was reluctant to leave Toronto as his wife was weeks away from giving birth. However, Hemingway was pressured and he went, leaving his wife at home. She would give birth to his first son whilst Hemingway was on a train ride home on October 1st, 1923. The last straw came in the form of a shouting match between Hemingway and Hindmarsh after Hemingway had missed a story of the Deputy Mayor of New York belittling Britain, which, considering the paper had a huge British readership, was a huge mistake. These final few months would end Hemingway's career at the Toronto Star Weekly, as he had not progressed in his creative writing, was not able to stand Hindmarsh any longer, and once again was longing for Europe. And so, Hemingway handed in his resignation on January 1st, 1924. By January 19th he was once again back in Paris, yet this time, he had returned with plans to fully commit to writing fiction. When reading through the early articles of Ernest Hemingway, the beginnings of his style of writing is revealed within the articles he wrote over the course of his career at the Kansas City Star and Toronto Star Weekly. 
Hemingway utilised the four writing requirements he had learned as a cub reporter, and took the subject matter from his years as a foreign correspondent, implementing both into his short stories and his novels. Bullfighting was only one of many subjects Hemingway would utilise, yet became one of the most famous subjects attributed to him. Hemingway would return to bullfighting many times in his writing, with the subject appearing in his short stories The Capital of the World and The Undefeated, and in books like The Sun Also Rises and Death in the Afternoon, a non-fiction book on the art of bullfighting. In Death in the Afternoon, Hemingway would repeat and elaborate on the statement of bullfighting being a tragedy and not a sport. The bullfight is not a sport in the Anglo-Saxon sense of the word. That is, it is not an equal contest or an attempt at an equal contest between a bull and a man. Rather, it is a tragedy, the death of the bull which is played more or less well by the bull and the man involved and in which there is danger for the man but certain death for the animal. Other topics Hemingway wrote on during this period, like boxing, World War I or fishing, among more would also feature in his later works. However, bullfighting seemed to be one of the most prominent. On occasion, Hemingway would return to journalism throughout his lifetime, yet he would mainly devote himself to fiction. He was a war correspondent during the Spanish Civil War and World War II, yet these odd jobs were momentary dabbles in the trade he had once relied on so heavily in his youth. Reflecting on his youth in an interview printed in a 1958 issue of the Paris Review, Hemingway spoke on the significance of his time as a journalist in the development of his writing ability. On the star, you were forced to write a simple, declarative sentence. This is useful to anyone. Newspaper work will not harm a young writer and could help him if he gets out of it in time. Luckily for Hemingway, circumstance helped him get out of journalism at the right time, as he was truly coming into his own as a writer when he left the profession. He had gathered enough subjects to write on by this point, and he had honed his skills for long enough to write true, declarative sentences with ease. And thus, when Hemingway returned to Paris following his resignation from the Toronto Star Weekly in 1924, everything was in order and he was ready, and only two years later, Hemingway had released a novel that would only be the first few building blocks of a long and prosperous career in fiction. A career which would see Hemingway win a Nobel Prize in Literature by 1954 and leave a literary legacy often imitated but never replicated. And it was journalism that was the foundation in which this career was built upon.